Good afternoon. <laughs> Good evening. Depending on where you are in the world, but you're in Las Vegas. Uh, welcome to Accelerate Your Digital Twins with AWS. I'm Brian O'Flaherty Wills. I'm the worldwide go market lead for AWS IoT Twin Maker, and I'm a principal in our IoT go to market group. I'm joined on stage by Shazia Sharma, who is our principal product manager for the AWS IoT Twin Maker service. And we're delighted to be joined by Kyle Ronning, Industry 4.0 lead for John Deere. So today, we're going to cover a lot of ground here. Um, I'm going to start by putting forth an argument that now is the time for us to be thinking about investing in digital twins across our business. And I'm going to give you a couple of customer examples where we're driving business outcomes with digital twin workloads. Shazia is then going to go deep into the technology and talk about AWS IT Twin Maker and some of the great new innovations in that service that are making it easier to build digital twins. And finally, Kyle is going to bring it home for us to talk about how Deere is implementing this technology in their business. So let's get started. And if, to the question of why now for digital twins, we have to first start with the question of what is a digital twin in the first place. And you know, we all know there's lots of definitions out there. I'm not here to say that I have a definition and it's better than anybody else's, but I, I do want to have this conversation first that we level set on our perspective at AWS. So you can all see the screen, you can all read the definition, but here's another way of thinking about this. Right? So a digital twin needs four things. We need a physical system. We need a digital representation of that system. We need a connection between the two. And we need a business outcome. We need a reason for doing all this. And if you take any one of those four things away, you no longer have a digital twin. OK? So why now? We're seeing lots and lots of interest and a lot of momentum behind this idea. And what I'd submit to you is that what we're seeing is a real simplification and cost reduction across a number of different underlying technologies that are really the building blocks for digital twin. And that's really what's spurring a lot of innovation in this space. So let me give you a couple of examples. Let's start with the physical layer. We're all familiar with the roughly 10x cost decrease in sensor technology over the last decade or so. And we compare that now with low cost, low power, highly secure wireless networks. So we've just got much more data about the physical world than we did in the past. So as an example, I was at an industrial customer recently, and they've implemented a suite of condition monitoring sensors on top of their key assets like pumps and rotational equipment. And that's to supplement their, their supervisory control system. So they now have much, much more data on how this equipment's actually performing and how it can possibly fail. And so we're seeing this all over the place. So there's more data about the physical world. But that data needs context. And this is where that third pillar comes in which is modeling. And when I talk about modeling here, I'm actually talking about two things. So the first is the modeling of relationships between physical entities and physical processes to reflect that physical reality. And here, innovations in graph database technology mean that our customers have much better ways of doing this at scale today than they did in the past. The other form of modeling is 3D spatial modeling. And here, reality capture has made a huge impact for our customers. So you know, in the past, to get an understanding, a 3D understanding of your space or your asset, you'd have had to do a reality capture that might have taken thousands of dollars. You might have done it once every year or so. Today, the retail price for a scan is about 10 cents a square foot. And so our customers are looking at this and going, well, we can actually do this on a regular basis, and we can have a re visual representation of not just the thing that was to be, but the actual physical space as it exists today in reality. And that gives all that data from physical systems that spatial context and that logical context to be able to do something useful with. Now, the final piece of this is at scale compute. And this is where we take that physical representation and we marry it with things like simulations, and very high scale 3D rendering. A lot of these workloads are moving into the cloud today, and that's giving our customers that breadth of technology. So this is all good news, right? We've got enabling technologies at hand here. But our customers have told us that 
Actually, digital twins are still hard. And I have spoken with hundreds of customers across industries about digital twins. And I get really consistent feedback about what the heavy lifting is around these workloads. And so we've kind of synthesized this into the keys to unlocking business value. I call these the three hard things of digital twin. So the first of these is working with data across disparate sources. If there's one thing that all of my customers in industrial operations will agree with is that we have too many data silos. Right? And that creates two problems. Number one, it's hard to access the data. But number two, it's actually really hard to get different systems to talk about the same asset or the same process in a similar way. So think about your distributed control system and your MES system and your asset management system. They all talk about the same piece of equipment, but they've got different tags and different ways of relating to it. So to put all this together and to have that central representation of your asset is actually really hard lift for customers. So now you've done that. And now six months later, well, we've decommissioned a factory line and actually we've added a new piece of equipment over here and we've changed out something over there. So all of a sudden your digital twin is no longer a representation of that as is physical reality. So here's the second hard thing. You've got to manage the life cycle of the digital twin along with the life cycle of your operational asset. And guess what? Your operational asset, your factory, your building, it's going to be around in 10 years. It's going to be around in 20 years. So you need to think about your digital twin workload in that time frame and in that context. It's hard thing number two. Number three is creating effective visualizations. And here, effective is the key word, because there are actually lots of really good 3D modeling tools out there, but that aren't necessarily appropriate for large-scale digital twin user workloads, because there's a lot of proprietary data formats. There's a lot of licensed software. There's not a lot of interoperability between formats. And so our customers are kind of struggling with pulling all these together. So those are the three hard things. And so if we could actually address some of these and sort of smooth out some of this heavy lifting, we would spur more innovation. There's no questions at the moment. We'll, we'll definitely take questions at the end. Thank you. So a year ago at reInvent, we launched into preview AWS IoT Twin Maker to try and address some of this undifferentiated heavy lifting. Now, Shazi is going to go into lots of detail about the service. What I'm trying to do here is just paint you a real brief mental picture about what this is and what it is not. So when we talk about customers, you have some context. So the first thing we said was it's hard to get at those data sources and model from those data sources. And what we learned from customers is they don't want to have to lift and shift and remove a whole bunch of data into a new platform to get at it. So what we've built with TwinMaker is a connector suite to allow our customers to connect to various data sources, time series data sources, to, uh, relational data sources, where they live. So using event-driven compute, using Lambda effectively, we can reach into those data sources and pull them. And we can get the data, but we can also get that context to allow us to model those physical assets or processes together. So that's number one. Number two, back to that 3D world, TwinMaker is not a 3D studio, right? So it's not another way of creating visualizations. What it is, is a way of taking those 3D assets that you already have and then marrying it with that logical representation. So in the tool chain, we allow you to pull that together. We allow you to give spatial context to that asset representation. And then the third thing, we want to create those end user experiences, right? And our customers told us, you know, we have different users. They're going to be asking different questions of the digital twin. So it's not a single pane of glass that we need. And so what TwinMaker is, is not a single pane of glass, but rather an app toolkit that allows developers to create different user experiences on the same t digital twin backbone. Okay. So that's AWS IoT TwinMaker. And so this is all good news. We have underlying technologies. We have managed services from AWS that are smoothing out some of this heavy lifting. How is this actually getting used? How is this impacting people's businesses? Right. And so I want to offer you a couple of examples, one from the industrial world and the other from the smart, sustainable building world that will give you a bit of an indication of this. And the first I'm going to talk about is Invista. Uh, so Invista. 
world leader in manufacturing of chemical intermediates. Think of the material in your car hair bag uh, as an example. So Invista is a fantastic AWS customer. Invista's done a lot of innovation to bring their operational data and workloads into the cloud. And when we discussed Digital Twin with Invista, they said to us, look, we've got all this data now in the AWS cloud. Our data scientists are looking at it, but we actually want to bring this data to users in our factories. We want to bring this to the technicians and the operators so that they can make better and more informed decisions with this data. And the initiative that we embarked on together was called Connected Worker. And the idea was to build an application that brought these data sources together on a mobile device for workers in the field. And so uh, working with Invista, this is an example of what that can look like. What we have here is a 3D representation. You can see how that's annotated with those data points that represent the key machines, the key assets in the facility. And you're seeing, the key thing about what you're seeing here is those different data sources. So you're seeing time series data coming from a historian database for analytics. You're seeing, um, you're seeing workflows come from the asset management system. You're seeing operational dashboards being pulled up all in context. So instead of having to look at this data and then go back to the desk, pull up a different database, close that down, pull up another database, and start to correlate all this together, you're seeing it all from that same logical context, from that asset-centric point of view. So Invista is really excited by this because, number one, this is a big productivity win for their skilled technicians and operators. But number two, this really drives employee engagement. This is really giving people the tools to make decisions faster and take ownership over their, over their business. So they're excited, and we're excited to be rolling this out across all of Invista operations. The next example I have is Toronto Metropolitan University, or TMU. So TMU is an applied research institute in the heart of downtown Toronto, uh, 50,000 students. And as an applied research university, there's a major investment in smart and sustainable building. As an example, the Daphne Cockwell Health Sciences building that's part of the TMU campus is instrumented with 14,000 sensor nodes. And this is everything from HVAC equipment, uh, water, lighting, air quality sensors, Wi-Fi nodes. And all these 14,000 sensors are feeding in half a million data points every day to the AWS cloud. And so with those half a million data points, the question is not do we have the data, the question is how do we drive insights from the data? And how do we actually contextualize data from these disparate sources and see how they relate to each other. And so TMU uh, is working with our partner, Fuse Forward, who's part of our AWS Smart City Competency Program. And they've created a digital twin of their campus to be able to contextualize some of this, this data. This is an example of what that looks like. So on the left-hand side there, you're seeing a representation that is the entire downtown campus. That's several city blocks. And on the right-hand side, this is a specific drill down into part of that TMU building. Now, the important thing here, how we got this data is from the actual BIM model. And so we can get very, very granular in terms of the kinds of subsystems that we're seeing. You can see, for example, on the top, an air quality anomaly. And we're able to track that air quality anomaly back to the actual air handling unit in the room. And from there, we're able to track downstream instruments like the the sensors, the, the VAV unit that's connected to it, we're able to see what else is going on on that same floor in that same space. So this is driving a lot more context to all of those data points. And from a TMU perspective, really the outcome that we're looking at here is insight, understanding of the kinds of issues that we're seeing in this smart and sustainable building space. So those are a couple of examples. And in this past year working with customers like Invista and TMU, what we've seen is the ability, or the opportunity rather, to actually go a step further and drive more innovation for our customers. And so the team has been busy working on some great tools in IoT TwinMaker, and Shazi is going to talk you through some of those new innovations. So Shazi, over to you. Hello, 
everyone. I'm Shasya. I am a product manager with TwinMaker. And I wanted to start by first saying welcome to reInvent. It is an absolute pleasure to have all of you here with us today. Now, in my section of this talk track, I'm going to focus on TwinMaker as a product. And we'll dive deep into that. And I'm also going to share with you everything that is the latest and the greatest with the service. Excited? OK. So in order to follow along in this section, um, we first need to understand how do we get started with the digital twin. To this end, there are four requirements that we must satisfy. The first one is building a model. Okay? Simply speaking, this means that we must create a digital entity for every physical resource in your system. These physical resources could be devices. They could be equipment that you have. It could be a floor space. It could be a process. Now, the physical resources that are available to us, they tend to generate IoT data. For example, you might have a camera that is generating a video feed. You might have uh, IoT sensors that are generating humidity, pressure, temperature data. And all of this data is stored somewhere. It could be within S3, it could be an IoT site-wise, it could be external to the AWS boundary. Where you store that data is not important. What is important is that you connect this data to the model that you just created. Step three, scene, com uh, scene composer. Now, scenes are probably the first things that come into your mind when you hear the phrase digital twins. Right? There are these 3D visualization of physical spaces that you can navigate from a place of digital comfort. The fourth one is application toolkit. And this allows us to bring everything together. Application toolkits are simply reusable um, visual components that you can use to craft custom applications on top of your digital twins. So say I satisfy all four of these requirements. What should the end product, or what might the end product look like? Here's an example. Depending on how you build, depending on how you customize, your end result may look something like this. What you're looking at here uh, is a digital twin experience for a cookie factory. It is literally a factory that is creating cookies. It's got mixers in there that's working with cookie batter. Now, I like to imagine all of this batter is chocolate and there's not a raisin in sight, but you do you. So let's take another look at this. In the top left, you'll see there are several alarm components, and they're all associated with our mixers. Our mixers are the entities in this digital twin. Our alarm components are simply telling us whether the entities are operating as expected or maybe they're malfunctioning and they need our attention. In the top right, you'll see the IoT data we were talking about. So you've got RPM, or the rotations per minute. You've got motor temperature, which tells me if my mixers are overheating and perhaps spoiling all that good batter. In the bottom left is where you see the actual physical visualization of the factory floor itself. Now, there are many other widgets here. And you can keep adding widgets, and you can keep removing them until you customize an, um, an experience that is perfectly suited for your application or your needs. Because you might not be running a cookie factory, as fun as that would be. Now, I have some exciting news, and that is that we have new launches to share with you in all four of these areas. So here onwards, I'm going to dive deep into each four of these, and then I'll share what's new. So first up, we have the model builder. Now, when you want to create a model with TwinMaker, you have three primary constructs available to you. Uh, these are entities, components, and properties. Um, I think we've already shared this enough number of times, but entities very quickly are simply digital representations of physical resources, where those resources could be devices, equipment, floor space, what have you. Now, it's not just important to create your entities. It's also important to create relationships between them. So understand that a relationship is unidirectional. It moves from a source to a target. Uh, an example would be, say we were trying to model a building. 
and this building has a number of rooms, it has a number of floors. In this case, each floor would be an entity, each room would also be one, and then we can model an hierarchical relationship to demonstrate the fact that there are multiple rooms sitting on a single floor, okay? Now, the second construct you have available are called components. Components simply add data and context to the entities they are associated with. Keep in mind that a component cannot exist by itself. It always exists in conjunction with an entity. Components can contain data within themselves. So for example, a component could have some amount of documentation. A component could serve as a connector and help you pull data from another source. So again, for example, IoT SiteWise, maybe S3. An example of a component, well, you already saw that in the cookie factory. We saw alarm components that were giving us data and context about our mixer entities and whether they were operating as per plan or not. Last of all, we have properties. Now, properties are contained within components. They're very simple um, to understand. They're simply values that tell you about the current state of your entity. An example would be on or off. Now, there are many things I like about the modeling capabilities in TwinMaker, but let me highlight a few of them. Uh, the first thing that I like is that it, these building blocks are super flexible. They're very modular, and you can put them together to create a variety of digital twins. You could create a digital twin for a football stadium. You could create one for a university. You could create an entire smart city campus. Next, it's extremely simple. So we keep... Um, honing on this point that your data is in disparate sources, right? So even though you are pulling in data from multiple different sources, this modeling system makes it easy for you because you have a single unified API interface to access all of your connected data stores. Last of all, it's very adaptable. So if someone, something were to change in your physical environment, you would be able to reflect that change in your digital environment very, very quickly and very easily. And now there is a fourth thing that I love about model building with TwinMaker. That is the TwinMaker knowledge graph. I'm very pleased to announce this. It is uh, super new. Um, you're probably hearing about it. Uh, for, we're sharing about this for the first time. So the TwinMaker knowledge graph, how does this work? Recall that I mentioned it's important to create relationships between entities. The reason that is important to do is because it allows you to organize and structure all of the data within your digital twin. With TwinMaker's knowledge graph, you can leverage uh, the relationships that are created to directly query an entity. That was a lot of words. Let me explain what I mean. <laughs> so say you have an air vent, okay? And this air vent is feeding a number of rooms in your building. Uh, sensors in one of these rooms triggers an alarm, alerting you to the fact that there is a rising level of carbon monoxide in that particular room. So now, using TwinMaker's knowledge graph, you can directly query the vent, and you can figure out which other rooms are connected to this vent. So not only can you go to the room where the alarm is active and fix the problem, you also now can take proactive action on all of these other rooms that are connected to this offending vent. Make sense? So with this example, we see that there are three advantages to using the knowledge graph. The first one is that you understand your data in the context of its broader environment. So you don't just know, okay, I have a room in my digital twin, I happen to have a vent. You now know whether the two are connected and whether changes in one will impact the other. Second, traditional debugging in large physical spaces does not scale well. It's not uncommon for operators to spend hours chasing an error or a problem in a physical space where the systems are loosely coupled with each other. TwinMaker Knowledge Graph speeds that process up for you because you now know which entities are actually related and might be impacted. Third, not only can you take action in your moment of crisis, you can also predict where issues are likely to occur in the future. 
The reason you can do this is because uh, the knowledge graph allows you to view your entire operation in a single pane. So let me show you what this looks like in action. So what you're seeing here is uh, a monitoring application for an organization. This organization has multiple facilities, and these facilities are geographically distributed. I mean, they're mostly concentrated in North America, as you can see on that graph. I'm going to try and find a facility here. Let me just uh, get it through a name. All right, so that's going to take us to the single facility view. You can see that I have um, telemetry data up top, HVAC, and lighting. I have a knowledge pane graph in the right, which is currently empty. I have a camera uh, views set up so I can see my facility from different angles. But what I'm really interested in is this alarm up top in break room number 201. So I'm going to click on that. When I click on that, it loads that entity in my knowledge graph. I'm also going to switch to the camera in that particular room because I want to see what's going on. You know, I suspect the problem is in a subsystem. So I'm going to go ahead and remove some of the 3D visualization layers that I've got here. You see what this did? This exposed the guts of the room to me. I can see the whence, I can see the ducts that are here. But I don't know if they're actually connected to my room or not. So let me go back into my knowledge graph and into the room and run my query. This query is going to do two things. It's going to show me a graphical representation of everything that is connected to that room. And it's also going to show me a visual representation highlighting the elements that are connected. Now I can start simply browsing this graph. I'll pick a went that I know is connected. I'm going to look at its telemetry data in the bottom left. Doesn't look, it doesn't look like there's a problem. I'll look at another went. Again, the telemetry data looks like nothing's unusual. I pick went number three. Aha, I see a problem here. The problem is that uh, there has been a spike in temperature and there has been a spike in the fan speed. So what do I do now? I can now connect with an operator and I can tell that operator exactly which facility, which room, which went, and which fan needs their attention. You see what I did? I was able to diagnose an issue in the digital world much, much faster than I would have been able to in the physical. Up next, we have data connectors. So simply put, data connectors allow us to bring data from multiple different sources into our digital twins. Now, regardless, your data can be within the AWS boundary or outside of that boundary, but regardless of where your data is, it doesn't need to move. Our job is to help build connectors that bring that data into your digital twin for you. Now, you can use an Amazon managed connector. These are going to help you connect to S3, to Kinesis video streams, to IoT SiteWise, or you can go build your own connector. You can build a connector to connect to a different Amazon service. Perhaps your data is an Amazon time stream. You can even connect to data that is outside uh, with an external data source, an OSI Pi perhaps, maybe Snowflake. Now, keep in mind that when you create your own connector, you're also going to have to author a Lambda function, and you're going to have to build a permissioning model around it. The reason you need to do this is it's because it's the Lambda function that fetches the data from the source that you specify. If you use an Amazon Managed Connector, we do all the heavy lifting for you. Which brings me to what's new. Now, we are pleased to announce the launch of the Twin Maker Athena Data Connector. As the name suggests, it is uh, managed by AWS, and it connects you to Athena, and it fetches tabular data into your digital twin. And the question is, why tabular data? Why not something else? There are certain use cases um, that are better supported by tabular data. And we learned this through discussions with our customers. So for example, you're looking at a piece of equipment and you want to see maintenance records. And these maintenance records are going back months or maybe even years. Better represented as a table, right? Or you have a factory shift schedule with dozens of employees. Again, better represented as a table than anything else. 
Now, keep in mind that when you work with the Athena data connector, you do not need to author any Lambda functions. You do not need to build out any permissioning models. We take care of all of that for you. What you need to do is um, you need to start, oh, come on. You need to start by creating a component of type connector. You need to specify which um, database and table you want to fetch your data from. And then, no, that's it. You're done. That was it. <laughs> All right. However, we are not done with digital twins. In order to create our twins, we still have two more requirements to satisfy. The next one is scene composer. Now, scenes are simply um, 3D visualizations of your physical space. Scenes are the primary way in which you will edit your digital twin. These are the primary way in which you will interact with your digital twin. Why are scenes important? Scenes are important because they give operators an ability to understand their data in the context of its spatial and physical characteristics. What do I mean by this? I mean that if I were an operator, a scene helps me understand how close or how far apart certain pieces of equipment actually are on the factory floor. Now, in order to get started with building a scene for your digital twin, um, you simply need to import a 3D visualization model into TwinMaker. This could be a CAD model, this could be a BIM file, it could be a cloud scan, it could be something else, whatever you choose. You also have available to you composition and positioning tools. These allow you to move your components within a scene until your digital scene perfectly matches your physical world. Now, you can make your scenes extremely informative and rich. You can layer in charts and graphs, interactive videos. You have a ton of IoT data. All of this can just be overlaid in. So your scene is not only informative, it's so much more powerful to work with. Last of all, just as with model builders, um, any change that happens in your physical world can be reflected very, very quickly in the digital with your scene composers. Now here we have two new things to announce. The first one is a camera view. You got a little bit of a peek into the camera view already, and you'll see that as I explain this. With the camera view, you can now define a point of view within your digital twin. So for example, if you wanted to see something, you, if you wanted to have a view from outside of the facility, inside the facility, inside a specific room, from a high vantage point, maybe from a low one, not only can you define a point of view, you can also save it as a preset for use in the future. Why would I want to do that? I would want to do that because it helps me navigate a large physical space in a very small amount of time. Next, we would like to announce submodel interaction. As the name suggests, you can now select, shade, interact with subcomponents uh, within a larger scene. Why would I want to do this? Now, you can highlight a small piece of, a very large piece of equipment to indicate perhaps that it's malfunctioning. So your operator knows exactly where to go and which part of that machine requires his attention. You might want to highlight something in your scene simply to represent that it's actually active and operational as opposed to sitting idle. Last up, we have the application toolkit. The application toolkit is a, it's a developer library. Okay? It's a completely open source, it's client side, and it gives you a large number of visual components with which you can custom craft your applications. Examples of these components, you've got line charts, graph chart, uh, bar charts, graphs, grids, status timelines, and many others. You've already seen two examples of app, uh, applications built using the application toolkit, toolkit today. So we saw the cookie factory, and then later we saw the monitoring application. Both of them were built using components from the IoT application toolkit. We are pleased to announce that we are now adding TwinMaker-specific components into IoT's application toolkit. 
What this means is that you simply have more flexibility and more options in the dashboard experiences that you create for your digital twins. You've got a number of components to play with. You've got a new data source component. You've got a new scene viewer. You've got a new video player. So as promised, we walked through four of those sections and we saw what was new in each. But I do want to leave you with a little bit more. You see, in true AWS fashion, we insist on over-delivering. I am extremely pleased to announce the preview of TwinMaker with Matterport. Now, before I run forward with this, I just want to test the temperature in the room. Um, are folks familiar with what Matterport is, what it does? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, so uh, there are, it's a mixed response. There are sections in the crowd that probably have not, are not familiar with it. Um, I think I have a few minutes to spare, so you know what, I'm gonna take you on a quick side quest. Um, have you used uh, the app Redfin? It's a real estate app, it allows you to browse homes that are on the market in uh, your locality. Redfin has a feature for a virtual walkthrough. It's like walking through a home as if you were really there. Uh, that experience is facilitated by Matterport. Okay, okay. Lots more nodding in the crowd now, so th <laughs> thank you. Side quest over, coming back. Matterport is simply um, 3D reality capture for a space. Now, why is this integration important for our customers? Not Every customer is an expert, expert in visualization technology. They don't necessarily have the expertise, they don't necessarily have the experience with CAD modeling or with creating a BIM file. Matterport simply provides customers with an alternative to digitize their space in a fast, easy, simple way. Now, um, depending on your use case, depending on your resources, you have multiple options with getting started with Matterport. So for example, you could get their LiDAR-enabled camera, and that could help you scan your industrial space. You could hire one of their service technicians. Um, they can come to you and help scan your space for you, and they're available in over 700 cities. Or um, if you really wanted to keep things simple, you could just scan even with your smartphone. Now, Matterport models, you will find are fully integrated with TwinMaker. They are spatially accurate. And uh, the best part about them is that you can layer in live IoT data into your Matterport model. Oops. Uh, that makes your Matterport model super um, powerful. So for your operators that are working with TwinMaker and Matterport now, it unlocks a number of use cases. So for example, there's remote service management for the day the operator couldn't come into work. There is virtual training for employees that are remote. There could be process engineering and so much more. Now I can keep trying to talk you through this experience, but I think seeing is the better option. At this point, I would like to invite Kyle uh, over on the stage. He's joining us from John Deere. Kyle is going to walk you through um, John Deere's journey with Digital Twins, with TwinMaker, and along the way, you will see Matterport in action as well. Again, my name is Shasya. You are a great audience. Thank you, and welcome, Kyle. Thanks, Shasya. Um, pleasure being with everybody here this afternoon. My name's Kyle Ronning. Um, Industry 4.0 lead at John Deere. <clears throat> and today I'd like to talk about um, a little bit about John Deere and who we are, uh, a little bit about why we got into digital twins and what inspired us to, to engage in this effort, <clears throat> and then leave you all with uh, um, some insights into where we're headed uh, as we move forward with digital twins. So uh, John Deere, right? So starting with our company motto, uh, we run so life can leap forward. It's a pretty powerful phrase uh, that, uh, that we deployed here in 2020. Um, and the first half we run really represents our commitment to our customers. The second half 
So life can leap forward really encapsulates uh, what we are focused on uh, as an organization. You know, uh, with our higher purpose, uh, we are focused on uh, feeding, uh, clothing, and sheltering the world. And we do so uh, with a variety of products and processes uh, to, to help move life forward uh, in, in a productive and sustainable way. We operate in three different equipment divisions, uh, as well as a number of uh, complementary business divisions uh, that, over, that overarch these, uh, these three equipment groups. So first off, we have production and precision ag. Uh, inside of uh, this uh, equipment division, you'll see things like large tractors, uh, planters, crop care equipment, harvesting equipment, things like combines, cotton pickers, sugarcane harvesters. In the second uh, uh, division, we have small ag and turf. Here you're gonna see small and mid-sized tractors, hay and forage equipment, uh, residential lawn mowing, golf, lawn mowing, golf mowers, uh, as well as utility vehicles like gators. And then in the last uh, division is our construction and forestry equipment. And here it's, uh, it's really focused on earth moving equipment, uh, road building equipment and tree harvesting equipment. Um, and so we have these uh, traditional heavy equipment divisions, uh, but in addition, we have a number of digital platforms and services uh, that we offer our customers. The one I wanna highlight today is Operation Center. And so Operation Center is, is a platform for our customers uh, to consume the data that's collected from their fields uh, convert that data into insights, uh, collaborate with trusted advisors, and, and, and most importantly, convert those uh, insights into actions in their fields as they engage in those acres on the next uh, farming process. Um, you can see uh, from this picture, you're seeing uh, area maps where equipment is located, uh, the plots of land that they're managing, uh, as well as some attributes around uh, uh, field performance, uh, yields, uh, things of that nature uh, that allow our, our customers to become more uh, productive as well as more sustainable in their operations year over year. So as we looked at this, um, these, these concepts that are brought to our customers from uh, using telematics equipment and sensors uh, from the fields uh, has a lot of value for them. And these are the concepts that we wanted to bring forward uh, to all of our employees in the organization. And so we did that uh, by building a tool internally we call Operations Digital Twin. Um, this tool is, is really focused on the twin maker concepts uh, that were highlighted earlier today and generating a spatial view of our facilities, uh, but also injecting those, those views with the information that's generated from those factories. Um, you know, here we really focus on uh, reality capture, and the primary reason for that is if you look at Operations Center, it all starts with the map. Right? You needed the map to overlay the information on to give somebody the context and meaning uh, for the data that's being generated. You know, from that field performance, the field analyzer view to uh, an operation center, you can see the areas of the farm that are underperforming the other areas. And so the spatial representation of data actually uh, generates insights faster uh, than, than reading them in charts and graphs. And so we focused on how do we bring mapping capabilities inside of our 62 factories around the world. And that's where uh, we started to engage in reality capture. And so here's, here's a view uh, of inside of our uh, digital capabilities lab uh, located in Moline, Illinois. This is a manufacturing uh, lab uh, focused on proving out emerging manufacturing technologies. And so this was the first place that we uh, captured um, th the, 
the experience of reality capture. We did all the debugging here, and we started to realize there's a lot of value in giving virtual tours of our facilities. And as we uh, progressed over the last year, uh, we've seen our spaces grow in uh, quantities substantially. We've got several hundred spaces captured across our organization, spanning uh, four different continents, um, and we see average about 15,000 uh, views per month of these spaces, and we're, uh, we're very close to the starting line as we embark on this journey. Um, one thing I do want to highlight is you, you also see some points of interest, right? You see these little uh, icons there. That's how we uh, bring data into the space, right? So geo-referencing uh, points, uh, layering them into these spaces, and we can do so uh, with uh, roles, security roles in, in, in the process so that uh, you as a user start to see the information that is relevant to you uh, as you're consuming these spaces. You know, maybe a few stories to highlight in this is, is really around some of the use cases. So when we started, it was really the basis for starting the digital twins. But what we're seeing is just in reality capture, we're generating a pretty significant amount of business value in terms of productivity, uh, efficiencies with uh, employees' travel, et cetera. Um, as you can imagine, some of our products don't ship all that well. They're very large in, in, in envelope size. And so we manufacture many of these products close to the, the markets that they serve. And that leads us into a position where we have uh, multiple factories building the same piece of equipment, very similar pieces of equipment for different market segments. This tool has allowed those folks to collaborate uh, in a much more productive way than they've been able to historically. No longer are they taking personal documentation with the uh, cameras and, and sending it to their peers at a, another site. Uh, they can collaborate uh, via you know, video calls uh, and, and actually be looking at the same thing and, uh, and making informed and better decisions uh, as they engage in this space. We've also seen it being used in uh, our facilities projects. We've got facilities engineering teams that support uh, a number of office spaces uh, around the country. And historically, they've had to travel and meet with contractors to engage in, uh, in projects uh, that are undergoing at those, at those sites. Having a tool like this, uh, we've been able to streamline uh, the employee travel to those sites, uh, but also uh, improves the productivity of our relationship with contractors as uh, we can do these uh, walkthroughs virtually opposed to doing them um, uh, on-site face-to-face. And lastly, uh, one that uh, probably surprises us the most of all is we're starting to see this being used in uh, HR processes. Uh, so when in recruiting and trying to, to bring talent uh, into our organization, um, there are people who you know, want to understand where, where is the, uh, the facility that uh, I'm going to be stationed out, out of and what does it look like? And we can have, during the recruiting process, we can have conversations with those employees and really give them exposure to uh, what to expect uh, as they embark on a career with us. And so um, we've seen uh, a lot of interesting use cases, as, as I've highlighted. Uh, but what I really want to highlight is where we're going, right? So everything I've, I've set up to this point uh, is summarized as in insights, right? We really want to convert these into actions, just as uh, we do with Operations Center for our customers. And so uh, in, in the next slide, uh, I'm going to show you a demo uh, that's a, like our initial draft at uh, how do we take these digital twins and actually uh, augment the capacity of our organization. But uh, before I show the demo, I want to make sure everyone is in the right context. So um, we have 62 factories around the world. We have uh, many thousands of uh, employees that are manufacturing our, our pieces of equipment. If any one of those operators, so position yourself as an operator in one of these factories, you're in front of a tractor, and you need assistance, right? Some part doesn't look right, you're out of a component, um, you know, what, for whatever reason, you need to find somebody to help you. Um, historically, getting um, advice 
uh, required you to uh, hit an and on light or grab a walkie talkie and communicate with, uh, with your supervisor or your supporting engineering team. And we're trying to augment that capacity of people having to physically move to you uh, in a new way. And so we've got a demo here called uh, Remote Assist. And so this is the view from the person on the other side of the factory, right? So as an operator, I need assistance. Something's not fitting right. Uh, you can make a, a request. We can zoom in. We can see the environment and understand the context. Uh, this is the reality capture experience. So me being on the other end of the line, I can understand the environment the operator's in. I can have a dialogue back and forth. So in this, uh, for this demo, we did it with chat. Uh, but intentional, this is intended to be a video conversation. Um, we put a pan tilt zoom camera uh, in the station. So as a remote employee, I can navigate and actually uh, control the video feed so that I can see exactly what you're seeing or what you're inquiring about. And so for, being on the, for not being uh, physically adjacent to that operator, I'm still able to have a very personalized conversation with them. Uh, we get to see each other face to face with the video chat. Um, I can, can uh, start to see what that operator is seeing, and I can do that uh, from the other side of the factory or in a, a different location altogether. And the value of this is really allowing us to augment capacity uh, of our frontline support employees uh, so that uh, we can ensure that we have good productivity in our factories uh, and really uh, addressing the employee needs. Secondly, it allows us to, to really uh, engage experts who might be located in a different location, right? Not always do you have the expert at the situation that uh, you're faced with uh, at your disposal uh, locally. And so being able to have tools like this allow us to engage people uh, who can augment the, the staff's knowledge uh, at a local level. So how did we do this? How did we stitch this stuff together? So this is a high level overview of really um, the, the tools and services that are used to, to, to build this capability. It starts with reality capture. Um, a big proponent of this is the IoT strategy, right? All of that data that was coming into that display is, is really uh, generated from applications and sensors in the facility. So uh, focused on uh, green grass instance uh, where we are leveraging SiteWise Edge uh, to uh, connect to these machines, uh, stream video feeds uh, to the cloud so that the experience for the, the person supporting the, the assembly line uh, can be done via a cloud interface, really allowing us to do this um, in any geography. Um, the, you know, I can, I, the, the highlight of the green grass piece is really to allow us um, uh, persistence at the factory in such a way that uh, we, we are not fully, like not everything is uh, required to have external connection to the cloud we can deadband appropriately on the data streams that we send. Um, and so uh, upon request, we can turn on things like the pan tilt zoom camera and stream that, uh, uh, that video feed uh, through Kinesis to, uh, to the person on the other side. And so um, that's, a, that's a really high level of some of the things that we're doing um, at John Deere uh, with uh, digital twins. Uh, we're really excited about uh, new capabilities that are coming uh, in the future, um, and we look forward to, to, to sharing uh, our progress as, uh, as we continue our journey. Appreciate the time. Thank you. I'll... That was awesome. Hi, thank you. Come back. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Kyle, for, uh, for that overview and that insight into Deer. So I just wanted to close off by thanking you, the audience. Um, Really hope this was useful for you. Well, we would uh, ask you one thing, which is your feedback. So take, take a look at that app on your smartphone. Please give us an indication of what was helpful to you. Give us an indication of what you'd like to see more or less of. Help us improve the experience for you. Um, if you're interested, I know there's a question at the audience. Uh, you can come and talk to the speakers. We'll take questions just over here for a few minutes afterwards. 
Also, absolutely feel free to connect to us on LinkedIn. Our profiles are right there. Happy to take questions and connect by that medium as well. Um, thank you very much again, and have a fantastic reInvent.